All right, in this video, we will put our menu system into action. The first menu we need to address is the main screen, which we have already begun coding. It was our screen class used to test the screen system. Right. But at this point, we need to address the fact that screen main is the game's main menu. And as such, it's going to have things like the different modes of play, and those modes of play need to be selectable. So we'll jump in here, and we'll begin changing this over to be an actual menu, and then handling all of the menu-related things we need to do. So this is going to have to start off by inheriting from menu screen? Exactly. Right now it's inheriting directly from screen. We need to change this to screen menu. And that way we'll gather all of the item management that comes along with a menu. The next thing we need to do is we will pull out the call to draw altogether. Mm -hmm. Since in this case, all we're worried about is the items themselves, and a menu gives draw menu item, so we don't actually have to do any looping or drawing ourselves. Right. So, looking through here, the first thing we need to do is set up the items that will be available from this menu, and we'll do this inside of the class's constructor. We'll make a public constructor called screen main. And inside of this constructor, we'll simply add items to the item names list. So again, we have this dot item names, which was inherited from the screen menu class, and we'll simply add string entries to this list. So the first menu item that we'll have is going to be called single player. Because we're going to have two different gameplay modes, single player and multiplayer, then in addition to the main game section, we're also going to have a free play mode, which will be the song recorder, and we'll also have a song editor. Okay. So now that we've got one item in place, I'll copy and paste it three more times, and then we can just go down the list and drop these in. So we've got single player, multiplayer, we have free play, and song editor. And that takes care of getting these items registered and usable. Now the next thing we need to do before we can actually see these items is we need to make sure that we override draw menu item. Which and currently has no functionality. We have to put some functionality into it. Exactly. So if we drop in an override here, because we are indeed a screen menu, we have access to draw menu item. So we'll drop in an override here. We'll take out our base call, since the base call doesn't do anything. And now we can begin drawing items, item by item. Now the first thing we'll do is we'll make a simple local variable to hold the text of the item. We already have that available in this dot item names and then a specific element, but we'll make this variable just to give our just to make things more concise in code here. So we'll make a string called text and we'll set that to be equal to this dot item names sub item index. Where again item index is getting passed in from this call to draw menu item. And the, the reason we're storing this in text is we need to reuse this, uh, this, t this string in a few places, and it's simply less bulky than having to address the full string list every time. Now the next thing we'll do is we need to take measurements of this text as it would be drawn using our font inside of the game. We need to do this so that we can space lines appropriately for the size of the text, and also so that we can center the text on the screen. Mm -hmm. Since the different names will have different widths when drawn, we need to know the dimensions in order to position all of this on screen. So we'll make a vector2 local variable called text dims, or text dimensions, and we'll set that equal to style dot font large dot measure string and then we'll simply take in the text string and then we'll store the measurements of that back out into our vector 2. So that's just giving you an x and y size. Exactly. And we will also record a position. Really all we're going to do is copy 
the main menu style position into a local variable for convenience. So I'll make a vector2 called position and simply grab the value currently in style positions dot main menu. All right, now that we have the positioning of the overall menu set up, let's look at drawing each of the individual items. Now there will need to be some offsets. We'll need to modify this position as we go element by element, but let's get the base drawing in place first so we know what the drawing of a menu item is going to look like. We'll call sprite batch dot draw string and first we'll need to pass in the font to draw string. We'll be using the uh, large font just like we used for measuring the text. So we'll look into style and grab font large. The text that will be drawn is still stored in the variable text. The position is stored in the variable position and color is passed into us via the parameter. So up here of course we have the parameter color passed into draw menu item. So really the actual call to draw string is very simple since a lot of since some of the information is handed to us and the rest we've defined. Now at this point the only we're getting the same position every time over and over again mm -hmm. for each draw. So if we were to run the game right now we would draw all of the menu items on top of each other. That means before drawing each item we need to take our y and offset it. So we'll look back at this position variable look at its y component and increment that based on uh, the item index exactly based on how f how far down from the top it should be where the uh, the top menu item will leave exactly at position so we won't increment by anything and that works with item index here because item index will be zero for the first item so we will we'll increment by item index well, we'll take that item index, since we don't want to increment one pixel at a time, mm -hmm. we actually want to increment by what you would say would be entire lines. Sure. So moving down based on the size of the text. Which would be the Y size of the dimension. That's right. That's where text dimensions comes into play. We can look at text dimensions dot Y, and that gives us the height. So now we move down by entire, you could say, lines of text. Mm -hmm. But in addition to this, we want to move just a little bit more to give spacing in between each line. So we'll take text dimensions dot y and multiply it by 1.5. Which is just giving you like a half a line separator. Right, so we get uh, one and a half line height per each one, or like you said, roughly half a line's worth of visible space in between each item. Mm -hmm. So, at this point, let's see what would happen if we were to run the game. Because, of course, we already have the screen main showing so let's build and run the game and the result we get are four items mm -hmm. but they're drawn at the top left corner of the screen and they're all drawn in yellow Yep. now this comes back to our default system inside of our style where we have all of our settings set up to indicate any setting that might not be set and if you remember back to the style configuration lesson we had set up yellow as a default co color inside of the style xml file so all this yellow color means is that we have not yet specified what text normal and text selected should be. Of course, over here in screen menu, we were using text normal and text selected. So at this point, it would be a good idea to jump in and give some settings for those. So we'll jump into content, then into style, which is already expanded, and we will load up style.xml. Now the two values we're looking for here are text selected, and excuse me, text normal and text selected. Text normal should be a value of 200 gray, meaning 200 across red, green, and blue. Text selected is going to need to be kind of an orange shade of color. So we'll have 255 for red, 196 for green, and 0 for blue. Now while we're in the style configuration XML file, let's also set up the positioning for the main menu. Since we saw how right now it looked like it was at zero zero, it's actually at one by one. But again, this is just picking up this default we left here in the configuration. So what we want to do is grab main menu and set this to a position value of 640 by 150. And looking at 640, if you think back to the uh, fixed internal resolution of the game. We're running at a width of 
1280. Mm -hmm. 640 is half of 1280, and that gives us the center of the screen in X. There you go. Now we're going to position these items closer to the top of the screen so we're not actually centering on Y. We're just giving an offset from the top. Now we'll make sure that these settings get saved into our XML file, and let's run the game again. Now you can see that we have the menu items positioned closer to the center of the screen, mm -hmm. and we can see that they do have the proper coloration. And since we're inheriting from menu, we can also hit the up and down directional buttons, and we can navigate item by item. Very nice. So already that's come along and is working. Now we want to have this menu appear centered, and we are centering what looks like left justified text. Right. You can see all the leftmost of each of those items are all in a line. Basically, that left margin is sitting on the middle of the screen, so it's pushing all the text over to the right. Now, in order to center up the items item by item, we need to take each item's own width into account as it's being drawn. So we can take care of that inside of screen main. As we're drawing menu items, we can modify the position X for each item before we draw it. So we can look into position.x, and we can decrement that because we need to move to the left of the screen closer to an X of zero. Mm -hmm. So we'll decrement, and the amount that we need to, to decrement is half of the given item's width. And that will nicely center up the item on the center of the screen. So text dimension is what, uh, X divided by two? Exactly. So once we put that in place, we can run again. Nice. And now we have nicely centered text. And we look. it looks like we're actually using center just uh, center justify mm -hmm. by each item. So, moving on from here, we need to add some of the functionality for these items. Now, we don't yet have screens for these items to navigate to, but we will go ahead and put in the functionality. Each of these items are simply going to invoke another screen. Hitting single player will invoke the song selection screen, multiplayer will do the same, free play will invoke the song recorder, and the song editor will also invoke the selection screen. So, what we'll do is, right before we get into our draw menu item method, we will override the screen's input pressed method. Now we have to be a little bit careful about our base call in here, since at this point, since we're a menu screen, we know that the menu system also needs to handle input pressed, so we need to make sure that our call to base.input pressed stays. If we were to wipe this call out, we would prevent our navigation for up and down. Right, we'd lose our key functionality. Now, what we need to do is, look, in addition to looking for up and down, which is handled in base, we need to look for the select button to be pressed. For example, the enter button on the keyboard. So, we'll put together an if statement, and we'll see if input data dot named input is equal to named inputs dot select. So if we're hitting the select button, then we need to invoke whatever menu item is selected. Now we will use the selection index to tell which item is currently selected. So we'll set up a series of if-else statements. So to begin with, we'll see if the selection index is zero. So if this dot selection index is equal to zero, then we know that the topmost item is selected. And looking at our list here, the topmost item is single player. So that means we need to advance onto the song selection screen. So we'll make a call to screen dot push screen and then we need to give a screen name. And this is a nice example of where our um, our loose referencing works well. Since our push screen method simply takes in the name of a screen, we don't actually have to have that screen in existence before we attempt to show it. Mm -hmm. Now the name of the selection, the song selection screen, is going to be select. So we'll simply drop that into our push screen call. Now, naturally, this call isn't going to work. We still don't have a selection screen, but we will be able to build and run the game. And, of course, in the screen system, we'll simply have a debug notification telling us that there was no such screen. Right. But this allows us to block in our functionality here inside of the menu. 
All right, now that we've got a selection and screen push coded out, let's copy the whole if statement and paste it in so that we can more quickly duplicate the code. Now this next block I'm going to write in as an else if, so we'll simply extend the if statement here. And in the case that the selection index wasn't zero, we'll check to see if it was one. Now if it was one, that would mean multiplayer. But again, we need to pull up the song selection screen before gameplay, so we'll leave the call to be push screen select. Now I will copy the else if block and paste it in. Then we can check for selection index two. Which is free play. And in the case of free play, that means we'll jump directly to the free play screen. So at this point in time, we will decide that the name of the free play screen is going to be simply free play. Mm -hmm. And we'll put in our call to push screen. Now, we will duplicate the else if block one more time, this time looking at selection index 3, which up here is the song editor. Which will also need the song selection screen so you know which song you're going to be editing. Exactly. So once again, we'll put in the name select. And that takes care of our final case that we're checking for. That's all four of the menu items considered. We still have our call to base dot input pressed. And so now we should be able to test some of our inputs and see what happens when we hit the select button. So with single player selected, I'll hit enter on the keyboard and nothing happens visually, but down here on the log we get screen select does not exist. Gotcha. And naturally, because we haven't created it yet. But so it's doing something. So multiplayer, the same thing. Free play, you see that the free play screen also does not exist. And the song editor tries to invoke select. Very cool. So our menu input, our menu selection code is working. We'll, we just have some screens that need to be coded in here in the future. Now one last thing that would be nice to add into our main menu would be to restore the back button allowing us to exit. Because if you remember in a normal X and A game you can hit the back button on the controller mm. and that'll exit out of the game. Here in this game, we've wiped out that call. If we look back over to our game class, so all the way to the bottom here, load up our game class, and then inside of our update method, you'll notice we no longer check for the back button. Again, because that code was utilizing only controller input, and our input system handles multiple devices. But we could put the same kind of functionality back in place using our input system. Here in input pressed, we could check and see if the back button is pressed and we're in the right state, we could exit the game. Mm -hmm. Now that right state would mean if we were at the main menu. We don't want to exit the game if we're at, for example, this score screen. We hit the back button. We don't want to exit out of the game there. Right, it would be a little premature. So it's important to make sure we're on the right screen before we allow exiting. So... Uh, the other interesting thing is we're doing this out here from the game itself because it's an, actually a method of this game instance that needs to be invoked in order to cause the game to exit. So what we'll do is here inside of our input pressed handler, we'll make an if statement. And inside of this in if statement, we'll check for the back button being pressed. So we'll look into input data dot named input. That is equal to named inputs dot back. Then we know we've got the right button. Now we need to make sure we are also on the main screen before we go ahead and exit. So if we're hitting the back button and the current screen, which can be gathered by looking at screen.active screen, now we can take that active screen, we can use the is operator to see if that screen happens to be a certain uh, of a certain type. And if that screen happens to be a screen main, then we know we're on the main menu because screen main isn't going to be used for anything else. Mm -hmm. It's the main menu screen. So we can call this.exit. Basically calling the exit method of this game instance. Makes now, sense so far. We'll drop in an else clause and we'll use that else clause to handle any other input. So in the case that the input wasn't back or wasn't the main menu, then we'll simply pass that along to the relevant screen as we were doing before. Gotcha. So we can test this out by running briefly and hitting escape. Allows us to jump back and the game exits. Very nice. An interesting thing to note is that means that at this point, the back button on the controller and the escape key on the keyboard will both allow us to exit the game. So with that, 
that should take care of our main menu. All right.